There's an update in the class action complaint against YouTube over content ID. It has survived dismissal. I think this is the first complaint against YouTube, let alone a class action complaint, to survive dismissal. Let's take a look. This is plaintiffs, Maria Schneider, Uniglobe Entertainment, and AST Publishing, alleging that YouTube and Google, which we're just going to call YouTube, facilitate copyright infringement through the use of a two-tiered copyright enforcement system. Con content ID, basically. In plaintiff's view, YouTube provides powerful copyright owners, such as major studios and recording companies, with access to content ID, a copyright management tool that allows owners to block uploads of infringing works, monetize infringement, and track viewership statistics of infringing works. Ordinary owners, such as plaintiffs, are denied access to content ID, which is said to make it impossible for them to police their copyrights, resulting in widespread piracy and infringement that they cannot meaningfully address. YouTube asks to dismiss the amended complaint under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b-6, Failure to State a Claim. To state a claim for copyright infringement, plaintiffs must allege ownership of allegedly infringed material and, two, that there's a violation by defendants of one of the exclusive rights conferred by the Copyright Act. So this seems like they're suing over the Section 106 rights and not for something like contributory copyright infringement or vicarious copyright infringement. The court says plaintiffs have alleged that here. They have done so here. The amended complaint alleges that at least one plaintiff owns each of the works at issue and that YouTube infringed those works by displaying infringing videos. YouTube's multiple arguments for dismissal are unavailing. It says that the phrases including and these works as millions of other works in the amended complaint indicate an attempt to allege claims for unidentifiable works. The point is not well taken, says the court. YouTube unduly slights the fact that the amended complaint specifically identifies allegedly infringed works owned by each plaintiff. This is enough to provide fair notice to YouTube of the claims against it. YouTube's suggestion that the amended complaint founders on a heightened pleading requirement is also misdirected. The allegations of infringement are sufficient to give YouTube fair notice of the claims against it, which is all that Rule 8 requires. I think YouTube is referring to the heightened pleading standards of a fraud allegation. This is a copyright infringement allegation. I don't think Maria Schneider's claim was a fraud allegation. YouTube says that plaintiffs have not sufficiently pled ownership of certain works. For example, it has proffered copyright office records that are said to cast doubt on Uniglobe's exclusive rights for three feature films. But this is a motion to dismiss, and the court declines to take into account such matters that are well outside the amended complaint. In addition, the amended complaint plausibly alleges that Uniglobe and AST Publishing own foreign works and that the works are exempt from registration requirements of the Copyright Act. YouTube contends that Schneider's claims for 28 works added to the amended complaint should be dismissed because she did not register copyrights for those works prior to filing the original complaint. The Copyright Act states that no civil action for copyright infringement shall be instituted until pre-registration or registration of the copyright claim has been made in accordance with this title. Registration is a precondition to filing an action for copyright infringement. This is the Fourth Estate Public Benefit Corporation v. wall-street.com case. Registration occurs and a copyright claimant may commence an infringement suit when the Copyright Office registers the copyright. It is true that some courts in this district have held that a plaintiff cannot cure failures to meet the registration requirement with an amended complaint. The court need not reach the question of whether it might agree. That is because plaintiffs here, unlike the ones in the other cases that were cited, are not seeking to cure any defects. Schneider's works identified in the original complaint were properly registered. In the amended complaint, Schneider added new claims for works that were registered prior to the filing of the amended complaint. Consequently, the amended complaint complies with the registration requirement. YouTube's scienter, or knowledge, point is equally uncompelling. It says that plaintiffs did not plausibly allege scienter for the claim that YouTube removed copyright management information in violation of Section 1202B, which states that no person shall intentionally remove or alter copyright management information, knowing or having reasonable grounds to know that it will induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal an infringement. So that's knowing or having reasonable grounds to know is red flag knowledge. That's the scienter they're talking about. 
Our circuit has determined a section 1202B requires the defendant to possess the mental state of knowing or having a reasonable basis to know that his actions will induce, enable, facilitate, or conceal infringement. The mental state requirement must have a more specific application than the universal possibility of encouraging infringement. Plaintiffs have alleged that here. The amended complaint states that YouTube knew that files containing audio or video works routinely contain content management information, that content management information is valuable for protecting copyright holders, and that the distribution of works with missing content management information on YouTube has induced, enabled, or facilitated or concealed copyright infringement. The plausible inference from these and similar allegations is that YouTube removed the copyright management information from plaintiff's works with knowledge that doing so carried a substantial risk of inducing infringement. And YouTube's concern about potential remedies is premature. The question of what remedies may be due to plaintiffs will be taken up as warranted at a later time. So that's really remarkable all by itself. Surviving a motion to dismiss means that the plaintiffs have plausibly alleged claims that connect to a, a legal claim for relief. So there's enough here, there's jurisdiction, there are enough facts to put YouTube on notice of what's being alleged. The plaintiff has not proven anything yet, nor has YouTube, and YouTube has made counterclaims and they haven't proven anything yet. Surviving a motion to dismiss means that the case will now proceed further into litigation further into discovery and eventually to summary judgment or an actual trial. There's still many places where Maria Schneider and her class can lose this case, so in no way do I want to convey the sense that this is a win in, in a final sense. This is a win in the sense that we've never gotten this far before in fighting YouTube over Content ID. Lots of us have lots of complaints over Content ID. I've had complaints that it's wildly inaccurate in trying to uh, assess whether my content is ad-friendly or not. Uh, others have said the same thing. Uh, I've been the subject of weird demonetization claims over the years, so I am on the side that the Content ID system needs to be reformed. So it's nice to see someone challenging it. And what I think is happening in Maria Schneider's case is she's too small of a creator for YouTube to care about giving her access to the larger content management systems, including Content ID, that YouTube gives to Sony BMG or other large established studios and large established creators. Those tools could fight copyright infringement on YouTube's platform YouTube knows that there's copyright infringement on YouTube's platform and that giving these people the tools to manage it could help, but they don't give it to them. And that sort of active involvement pushes it over the edge into copyright infringement, according to Maria Schneider. I see it. I see how she's getting there. YouTube is liable for the infringement of its users can't claim safe harbor or anything because it has that active step of denying access to a system that has access to that information. YouTube, the company, has access to that copyright system, so it knows there's potential infringement, and it doesn't pass that on to the owners. So I think that's what's going on there with the Maria Schneider case. So I guess we'll still have to wait for what the judge is going to do about all the discovery dispute problems but at least the judge has ordered that the complaint, the first amended complaint, will survive dismissal. The relief that Schneider and her class are looking for, they want the court to determine that this is a class action. Uh, they want an injunction preventing YouTube from infringing, from causing infringements to adopt uh, technological measures, including content ID for everyone. Yep, all persons, award the profits derived from the infringing acts or statutory damages, I guess whichever is greater, plus willful, a willful multiplier for willful misconduct, disgorging profits direct and indirect illegally obtained, finding the defendants, Google and YouTube, jointly and severally liable, uh, prejudgment interest, I guess post-judgment too, 
attorney's fees, costs and expenses, and all other relief the court deems just and proper. So we'll keep an eye on that. That's the farthest that a copyright lawsuit against YouTube has gotten, I think. I don't, I don't think anyone else has succeeded because YouTube's contract with you is pretty strong. I'm assuming the contract's not going to protect YouTube in this case. Otherwise, it would have been in that motion to dismiss. So we'll keep an eye on that. Hopefully, the case does not settle unless that settlement includes opening the content management system for everyone. But it is an interesting claim that YouTube is liable for the copyright infringement of its users because it knows that there are infringements and doesn't give the tools to the genuine, sincere authors who just want to fight the copyright infringement. It's an interesting argument. I'd like to see where it goes. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my top supporters in August, John Steele, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hytov, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Gut Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Wyatt Calandro, King Ares, and Kyle Seafring. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJ French, on Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.